Welcome, my friends, to the Sage Equay Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Today, my very special guest and friend is Scott Meikle-John. Scott is the proprietor of Gojira FX guitar pedals out of Scotland. I caught up with Scott to talk about his company, his custom builds, and approach to guitar effects. We also discussed the overall state of guitar gear as competition heats up across the world. And so without further ado, here's the conversation with Scott. Well, folks, we're going to have a great show today, and uh, this one is going to be very different. I'm going to depart from the typical conspiracy research and alternative research, and I'm going to talk to a friend of mine, Scott Meiklejohn, who is the proprietor of Gojira FX guitar pedals out of Scotland. And uh, recently, I guess about a month ago or so, maybe a little longer, Scott sent me two of his pedals, his distortion pedal and his 808 tube screamer. And I've been playing these, uh, these pedals. I've been using them for the last few weeks, and I love them. They are great sounding pedals. And so what I wanted to do was just to catch up with Scott because um, musical instruments, as many of you know, I'm a guitar collector, and I'm even more fascinated by folks that are able to build things like guitar pedals because this is something not within the realm of my awareness. You know, I just buy them and use them, but to actually make them, is fascinating to me. So, Scott, welcome, and thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, thanks a lot for having me, Mike. It's a pleasure. Good to catch up with you. Yeah, thank you. No, it's great. It really is. Now, Scott, how did you get into building guitar pedals? This is not something that a lot of people venture off uh, into doing as a career or as a job. Yeah, pedals, I've always, even since I was, I've been playing guitar since I was about 11 years old. Um, and as soon as I got up to a kind of decent standard and started getting into the bands that I liked and stuff like that, uh, I was always heavily influenced by bands that used a lot of pedals, a lot of fuzz. So I was always chasing that sound. Even before I, was, I didn't really know what pedals were, I was always doing weird things on my arm and my guitar to try and get different sounds out. Of it. And then when I did come across pedals, it's like it just opens up a whole new world, basically for especially the type of music I was playing, which um, uses a lot of different modulation guitar sounds and stuff. Yeah, so getting into pedals, I was always buying pedals and then getting annoyed with not being able to fix them myself and stuff like that, you know, and having a lot of having a lot of friends in bands and eventually I became the guy that if something broke, see if Scott can fix it, you know, because I did have a bit of a background in electronics. I worked as an electrician um, when I left school, so a slight background in electronics and then managed to stumble into that. I managed to have enough uh, um, a bit of a gap between employment, let's say, where I, I had a bit of time to, to sit down and say, right, let's try something new here, you know, let's try something that I want to do rather than just jumping into another job as well. So it kind of worked out nicely, you know, it's something that I kind of fell into job-wise and something that I've always kind of wanted to do as well. It just didn't really hit home for me to do it until I got to about 30 years old. <laughs> well, like I said, what I'm going to do, I, I mentioned to Scott before uh, we get started here, folks, that what I will do at the tail end of this show is I will demonstrate the pedals. And again, I have the, the distortion pedal and the 808 uh, Screamer. Both are great pedals. So Scott, I agree that there are times, actually there are many times when you purchase a pedal expecting it to do something that is pleasing to your ear as a guitar player, right? As a yeah. musician. And then once you get the pedal and you're playing around with it, it's kind of like, ah. Uh, it's not really what I thought it was going to be. I'm not getting the sound that I want out yeah. of it, right? So how do you go about getting the sound that you want? I know this might get a little technical, but the components within a pedal, as an example, if we take a distortion pedal, and folks, here's the distortion pedal that Scott sent over to me, and we'll get into the artwork in a moment. But as you can see, this is the, uh, the Sgt. Pepper album cover. And let me just pause here for a second and show the other pedal. This is the um, the 808 Tube Screamer, and again, the artwork is custom, and, and Scott did this for me, and this is great. That's Billy, and again, Billy looking a little sad, I guess because he's disclosing. He's not really sure how people are going to take it. So how do you go about getting the sound that you want out of the pedal? So if, if it's a certain distortion sound that you're looking for, how do you do that? A lot of it is total trial and error, is sitting down and experimenting. Thankfully, because there's, there's been so... I didn't start doing it until quite recently. There's been so many people behind me and because of the internet as well that there's, there's so many frameworks there that I can start from when I can go and look at a circuit, like an existing popular circuit 
that I know is verified and works, and then I can start changing wee parts of it and work from there. You know, so it's like when I first started building them, it was um, find something like a tube screamer or a, another kind of distortion pedal, build it up, understand it, find out what's going on there, and then you can start experimenting a wee bit more. But still, it is a, a lot of trial and error. Like absolutely, I mean, it's making the mistakes that I learn how to do things. So it's. I've been I've been lucky that there's so much information about it on the internet. I don't really I don't really like using forums and going into discussions about all the pedals and everything, but there's so much information of the schematics for absolutely everything out there. If you're willing to take the time, you can understand that language of the schematic. It's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle almost, you know, when you once you start you know, getting into it. But as far as in distortion pedals, I mean, you can really, really experiment. When it gets into the modulation stuff, it's a bit more precise and uh, finding out what, what you need for what job and stuff like that. But with the first pedals, I mean, you can you can really get carried away with experimenting with different components and stuff like that. And so there's a so there's no shortage of experimentation with it, and that's how I've learned anyway. Just learn from my own mistakes. And I've been quite lucky as well that some, um, some guitar companies are very, very helpful. Let me ask um, a question that I've always wondered. Uh, well, I, I know the answer now, but as when I was growing up and uh, playing in bands in the early days, I was uh, not always able to distinguish or define the difference between a distortion pedal and an overdrive pedal. Yeah. What is the difference between buying a distortion pedal and an overdrive pedal? There has to be a difference, otherwise they wouldn't distinguish between distortion and overdrive. I, I see it as a kind of... Like a spectrum and overdrives on the lighter side of the spectrum, distortions on the heavier side of the spectrum. And then I know fuzz isn't exactly the same kind of thing, but it's as if fuzz is at the very end of the spectrum. It's just total noisy, you know? So when it comes to overdrive sounds and distortion and even pedal sounds, it's so subjective. And this is why I don't get into the forums and all that as well, you know, because it's what's the best overdrive pedal. And then you see people arguing for the next 50 minutes about what is or isn't an overdrive pedal, you know? And it's, I have a guitar channel, and uh, there are many times when I will build a guitar or restore a guitar, and or I'll put new pickups in it, and uh, people will say or will ask, "Well, how come you know you don't do a a demonstration with the guitar?" The reason for that is, well, first of all, it takes time to do that, to set up and do all that stuff, right? So I have put some up there, folks, if, in case you're uh, wondering, and I will put my guitar channel link uh, in the description box below. The thing is, as you said, Scott, it's very subjective. So if uh, if I'm playing through a certain amp yeah. with certain effects, I don't really understand how anybody's going to discern what that means to them because they don't have my configuration. Yeah, You know what I'm saying? Even if they bought the same pedal, as an example, I have Scott's distortion pedal here. And even if uh, they go out and buy this pedal, well, they may not be using the same settings yeah. that I have on the pedal. You know, so it gets to be very granular. It is very subjective as far as the sound that you get. Uh, and, and one pedal that somebody loves, another person can not like at all, right? Yeah, and when you do see pedal demos, most of the time, um, if it's a, quite a popular YouTube channel, the guy's plugging into a really expensive amplifier with a really expensive guitar, and he's like, here's my clean tone. Like, I can't afford your clean tone, you know? <laughs> so it's, 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 it's not going to compare to what anyone's got in their bedroom. So normally if I'm doing, if I'm testing out the pedals, I run them through a couple of different amps. I've got a wee small one just for practicing in the house, and I can take them down to the studio and run them through a volume and stuff like that as well. So get to hear what they're like. And, and, and they behave totally different. Yeah. Different amplifiers completely. Orange amplifiers are so weird with some distortion pedals. It's... Um, they don't ha I don't think they handle um, modulation particularly well either, orange amplifiers, but they've got such a beautiful sound when it's just that overdriven. But I've always seen pedals as um, more of a... When I've been building them, I've always, I've always had them as a, in, a, in a band situation in mind of how you can get about your different sounds live in a band rather than... Because you can do everything digitally nowadays as well in the bedroom. No, it doesn't always sound the same, but... I'm an old school amp guy. I don't like all of the uh, the sampling and all of the built-in effects. I don't like that. In fact, I find that many times uh, I had a Spider 112 amp. I, I sold it uh, about a month ago or so. I had it for a long time. It was one of my amps. I have uh, maybe four or five amps. I finally got rid of it because I found that 
with all of those sampled amp sounds and the, the built-in effects that it conflicted many times, Scott, with my wah pedal. I could not get the wah pedal to, to sound right, you know. And um, so I, I concluded that it was because that there was a conflict between what the amp had component-wise as far as to create its sound and then the signal of the wah pedal going in. So I know I'm going to yeah. get people that are going to say that they don't have that problem, and that's great. If you don't have that problem, just saying that I've experienced it, not just with that amp, but with other amps. So I'm old school. I, I go back to the old days because, you know, folks, I'm not a young guy anymore. I mean, I'm 60. So <laughs> I go back to the days of uh, when the amp was just straightforward. You plug it in, you had a volume, you had your, your tone knobs, and you had some reverb, and that was about it. So I like creating the sound through my pedals. Yeah feeding it into an amplifier that essentially is just an amplifier. It's not anything else beyond that. So, and in fact, the, um, the amp that I, I like to use is a, is a tube amp. It's a mono price. It's, uh, I think I got it for $225. It has lots of volume. And that's the one that uh, I like to play through. Yeah. So it's really weird. I have more expensive amps, but sometimes more expensive doesn't mean better. Yeah. You know, sometimes it does, you know, no question, but other times it doesn't mean that. My favourite amplifier to play just in the house is a, it's a wee small freshman. So I, I, a guy that lives in Scotland that builds them actually. So I thought I would try it out. And it's, it's, it's meant to be designed for uh, electroacoustic guitars. Yeah. But it's actually it's, it's really, really nice sounding just at low volume. It's got a lot of bass and everything. So I've never, I'm, I don't really own any particularly expensive guitars either. Um, I do happen to have a very nice bass at the moment that I borrowed from someone but <laughs> to do to do a few pedal demos. But no, I play an Ibanez. That's my main guitar, and it was maybe about three hundred bucks, and I wouldn't swap it for anything. It's got the most beautiful action on it I've ever played my guitar. Well, that's another thing. Maybe we can get into a little bit. Maybe we should talk about that now. Is that I've got some guitars that are on the more expensive side. I have uh, a Gibson uh, Standard T twenty sixteen. It's a beautiful guitar. But here's the thing: I have it. It's a beautiful guitar, but I don't play it. It's, it's a very strange thing, you know. I prefer to play the guitars which are less expensive and the ones that I've actually invested time and effort into building or upgrading. Yeah. I really enjoy playing those, right, versus something that's, that's just off the shelf. But that's just my personal preference. But the thing, Scott, is that um, guitar prices have come down significantly, you know, from going back to, to years ago. You know, if you go back 30 years ago, 40 years ago, if you bought a cheap guitar, you pretty much got a cheap guitar. Yeah. Today, you could pick up a guitar for $200, $250, $300, bucks, let's say under $400, and you have yourself a very, very nice guitar. Would you agree? Absolutely. I think um, Gibson and Fender have kind of been their own worst enemy. I mean, uh, when I was dealing with a few of the guitar shops in Scotland, and speaking to speaking to them about sales of Gibson and Fender, you were saying, are they still the main sellers, or is it these local luthiers and things like that? And they were saying Gibson and Fender, they make all their money out of t-shirts, badges, things like that nowadays. That's where most of their income comes from. So I think a lot of guitar shops are more inclined now to try and get the, the, the smaller companies in as well, especially pedals as well. Yeah. Uh, there's, yeah. There's no markup for them. There's no, there's no money to be made for a, for a small guitar shop selling boss pedals or something like that, which are great, great pedals, you know, and everybody wants them, but it's hard for the industry then, you know, for someone with a small shop. So um, the more they start getting smaller makers in, the, you know, absolutely the great that is for, for all of us. It means more choice as well. It's, like I said, I have... Uh... The genuine stuff, I mean, as, as far as uh, the Gibsons and the Fenders, uh, and some of them are on the more expensive side of the house. And um, and don't get me wrong, they're very nice guitars, they play well, but I have a hard time reconciling the price differential. In other words, I'll pay, you might pay two, three, four, five thousand dollars for a Gibson, you might pay a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars for a Fender. But like you said, you could buy an Ibanez or you could buy uh, another brand of guitar at your local guitar shop for three, four hundred dollars. Uh, I guess maybe you could pick up subtle differences in why the two or three or four thousand dollar guitar is is a better guitar. Yeah. You know, craftsmanship, wood and stuff like that. But it's very hard 
to uh, to defend the difference in price. Yeah. So it's not two thousand dollars worth of enhancements or feel good stuff, in my view. That's been my experience. So Gibson and uh, not F I think Fender to a lesser degree because Fender did a nice job with the whole Squire line of guitars. Yeah, absolutely. They did a nice job of introducing Squire and keeping that as basically their entry level and really good guitars, nice guitars. They're well made. Yep. But Gibson hung into that upper stratosphere paradigm for a long time, and it came back to, I think, to bite them big time. I don't follow them as closely as I used to these days. I know that they're under new management, so I don't know what their plans are going forward, whether they're going to farm out their guitars to lower-cost countries. Everything used to be um, American-made and all that, and I guess that was, in their minds, a way of uh, maintaining or validating the reason for the prices that they were charging for the guitar, right? Made in America, so, hey, you're going to pay more. But that model doesn't work too well when everybody else is farming the work out and eating your lunch. Yep, absolutely. So anyway, uh, and like I said, folks, you know, I, I own five Gibsons, and uh, I love them. But I have other guitars that cost a lot less, and I love to play those equally as well. Don't get me wrong, I would love one. I mean, my friend's got one. Whenever I play it, I'm, I'm so not used to the weight, obviously, as Paul. Like, oh, whenever I put it on, it weighs an absolute ton to me. But it feels so lovely to play, you know, that weight adds something to it. And it's they're beautiful. They're... Yeah, they are beautiful guitars. They really are. And maybe what I'll do is when I do the demo, I'll play my standard T and uh, yeah, awesome. you take a look at that. What you were saying about like, the price difference is um, very much the same in the pedal world. Uh, there's a lot of pedal companies who have been lucky in recent years because certain bands and things like that have used their pedals in the market and they've charged maybe 400 bucks for the pedal and I could sell it for 50 bucks. Yeah. Well, I think that the, um, the Chinese, as an example, companies like uh, Donner and Sonic Cake, yeah. they are coming in at a price point that is just wiping out yeah. The the brands that are trying to get a premium for their pedals. And it was interesting, you know, I'll go on Amazon every once in a while and I'll take a look at the reviews of these pedals. And for the most part, they're very, very positive. Yeah. Four stars, or maybe some of them even pushing five stars. And you're picking these pedals up for 30, 40, 50 bucks, 60 bucks. Whereas uh, an equivalent pedal by a company like MXR or pick another brand, Boss, these pedals could cost two to three times the amount of money, yep. you know? And then you read the reviews on the higher priced pedals and a lot of the reviews are mixed. Don't get me wrong, there are some good reviews, but then yeah. the reviews are not commensurate with a pedal that costs two to three times more than what a lot of these, uh, these Chinese manufacturers are, um, are putting out these days. How is that for you, Scott, as far as the Chinese market? Do you find it something that you have to compete with or are your guitar pedals priced at a point where you don't really have to worry about it? Because I, I, I believe your pricing is very good. I just try and ignore it, basically. You know, I just see it as that's not my, that's not my market. You know, I think um, the people really enjoy getting to speak to the person that's building their pedal and getting their own artwork on it and getting exactly what they want. And, and not everyone's face-to-face -face talking with me like that, you know, but... Um, I think some people want to get away from the mass-produced stuff that's out there. Yeah. Uh, and I think I think one of the, I don't know which one it was. One of those small Chinese companies recently lost a legal case with Electro Harmonics because they cloned one of their one of their ICs, one of their chips in a pedal. But it's always been the same with components that someone steals the idea out of the factory and then goes and makes it down the road in China. You know, it's it's always been that way. Well, the Chinese. Um... Are notorious for not caring too much about trademarks and copyrights. Oh, yeah, it's, it's quite, a, quite a laugh looking through that stuff, actually. Yeah, yeah I mean, all you need to do is uh, is to go take a look at a site like AliExpress, and uh, you could see how they're cloning the uh, the major brands of guitars with the yep. headstocks and so on, right? So the Chipsons and the, and I guess they call them Chenders, which is a Chinese Fender. <laughs> so, so they haven't been very uh, discreet about no doing things like that. But on the other hand, you know, not to knock the uh, the Chinese, uh, there are a lot of companies out there, Chinese companies that are not doing that and they're actually putting out their own authentic products. And yeah. you know, these products are, they're not bad at all. In fact, the quality on many of them is very good. But like you said, 
you're in the business of, and I guess we could describe it as more as like a boutique pedal. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, to, to be honest, I don't really want to go up to a, a, a big level. Um, yeah. I mean, just, I'm a, it's only a one-man show at the moment as well. You know, I'm doing everything myself, so everything's got to, I can't really build any more than I, than I can in a certain time frame and stuff, you know, so I'm, I'm quite comfortable with where it is. It gives me a living and things like that, and yeah, and, and maybe will eventually grow into something a little bit bigger, but I'm not, I'm not in any, in any rush to really, you know, I'm quite, quite happy with where it's at. Now, are you able to, uh, to get your foot in the door into uh, music stores? Yeah, I've been to a few um, uh, all over Scotland, and it's only really the independent ones that I, that I really bother speaking to. It's not really, maybe with the chains and stuff like that, it's, it's not really worth my about. It's not really worth my time then to give them a pedal in. Or they want to give me a really small percentage back, you know. It's, it just doesn't really work. So if I go into the small independent ones, I can, I can work something out face-to-face, and they've all been very good. They're all... They're all quite pleased to promote someone local who is building that kind of stuff, and yeah, it's been good that way. Yeah, I prefer going to the uh, the smaller music stores. Um, I was um, just in uh, L.A. recently to go visit family, and there was a music store there that just blew me away. It, it had been there for um, 40 years, 50 years or so, and there was just... Boy, it's just a collection of vintage stuff. I love vintage guitars and, and um, stuff like that. And it was it was just nice to be there because you could see different designs of guitars and the different looks. And, you know, in my view, there was a uniqueness about a lot of the instruments that came out. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, even I'm a big collector of, uh, of the, uh, the old uh, Japanese lawsuit era guitars. I love that stuff. And I have probably 10 vintage uh, made in Japan guitars that are in beautiful condition these days. You know, some of them I've had to, uh, to work on and restore, but they're excellent. I love them. But when you go into the chains, like here in the United States, we have uh, Guitar Center and we have Sam Ash, right? It's all of this homogenized, run of the mill, standard issue stuff. Yeah. I don't know. For me, that doesn't do it for me. You know, it's just something very static very sterile and very boring about what it is that these stores are uh, trying to sell. Yeah, I can, I can understand that some people want to chase a tone that they love. You know, that I, want, I want to sound like that musician or I want to sound like that. So there's always going to be, you know, the market for the, the run of the mill stuff. But yes, thankfully, I'd, I've got a lot of people who are wanting to sound very different. They want their own unique sound and they're, and they're looking for something they can't find out there in the market. So... Even if it's just, uh, it's not always just like a tube screamer or distortion pedal. Sometimes somebody will want something about a bit of weird looping in it, you know, with just a, a weird routing system so they can have two amps going at the same time so they can have a like an octave sound, like a kind of bass sound going through one amp and then their guitar. The shape of bands nowadays is very, very different, if you like, you know, to what it was in the, in the 70s, 80s and even 90s with the amount of different gear that people are using through guitar amps and you see people nowadays with um, a synthesizer and a bigger pedal board than some guitarists, you know. It's, so there's, there's also a market for that, for marketing pedals to people who use synthesizers and keyboards and, and obviously basses as well. Now, on your website, I was taking a look, and you have uh, a number of pedals. I'm in the market for a, uh, a flange and a new phase shifter. So can I get that through you? I've been meaning to get onto the phasers. Yeah, absolutely. It's not. It's not something I have. Um, like the pedals that are on my website are my my bread and butter pedals. If you like the ones that I've like, I've got a big pile of PCBs there for the printed circuit boards, and then they are just ready to go in the custom orders and everything. But yeah, I mean, h- how I actually end up adding a pedal to that range is normally because a customer comes to me and says, "I want this. Can you build this for me?" build it, end up really liking it, thinking, yeah, this is this is a keeper. We'll, we'll put this one into the range as well, you know. So so absolutely, you know, that's how a new a new pedal comes about for me. Normally when somebody says, You don't have this, can you build this? I'm like, let's give it a go. <laughs> we'll see what we can do. <laughs> All right. So I, I think what I'll do is um I'll hit you up after this show for yeah, a no face problem. pedal and a a flange. Sound good? Yeah, sounds good to me. Yeah. <laughs> All right, all right. So We'll, uh, awesome. we'll give that a shot and, and see how that turns out, which I'm sure is going to turn out great. Now, Scott, the other thing I wanted to uh, to ask you about, 
a lot of guitar players, there's a lot of uh, quibbling and arguing and debating about when you have a, a pedal board, the sequencing or the chain of pedals, what goes before what? Yeah. And uh, so I'll, I'll give you my setup and uh, you could tell me if, uh, if you have something different in mind or whether I should tweak mine. But, well, first of all, I'll have the, uh, the guitar will come in first into the tuner. Yeah. And then after that, I'll go into the compression box then my wah pedal, and then from my wah pedal, it'll go through my distortion overdrive pedals, and then into my chorus and delay. So that's that's how I do yeah. it. I sequence it that way. Does that sound like a reasonable change? Yeah, that's, that that's, that that's, how, that's how I would do it. Again, I kind of I start to think of it in that kind of spectrum way that I start off with. Obviously, your pedals like your tuner, and I use an octave pedal as well, an analog octave, so I keep it very early in the chain ends. You want a really clean signal going into like your tuner and an octave. And then I start to go from kind of light to heavy, eh, my overdrives, my distortions, my fuzzes, and then into the modulation, eh, delay and reverb blast. Like what you were saying about um, bars earlier, they're notoriously bad for sucking tone and um, messing up the, the line, if you like, from guitar to arm. So have you ever tried using a buffer pedal? No. Well, it, it may be worth uh, putting a buffer before or after your, your wah-wah. It just sometimes smooths it out a wee bit, you know, because wah-wahs are really bad for sucking tone. Okay. If you, especially if you've got a, a long a long line of pedals. By the time it goes through all the pedals, it's nowhere near the same signal as it was going in. You know, yeah, so put the buffer pedal before the wah pedal? Yeah, put the buffer pedal quite early in the chain, you know. Just smooth stuff out. Some people, even if you've got a big long chain, I'll, I'll send you a couple of buffer pedals over because they're, wee, they're just wee tiny things. So it's just in and out, nothing to it. And I'll send you over those other ones. Um, put one at the start and the end of your chain and just even move it about and see what makes the, the best difference. It, it, it does make a bit of a, a difference that when you're using a big uh, long chain of pedals and you plug it in, it sounds like you've just plugged straight into the amp rather than you're going through all the pedals, you know. It's, so they're definitely worth a try. But the uh, pedal very, very subjective. You see people arguing about it all day. Should I put more overdrive before my fuzz? And it's like, it totally depends what sound you're trying to get, you know. It's, uh, the other one that you see people arguing about is whether to put a, your pedals in going in the front of your amp or whether to put them in, like, in the effects in an outlook in the back of your amp. You see people arguing about that. No, you've got to have a delay in there. I, I've never, I never ever used the effects in and out when I played in bands and stuff like that. It's always been straight into the amp. Yeah, that's how I do it too, you know, straight into the amplifier. Now, David Gilmore was reading um, a couple of articles going back a while, and uh, so he would even use a combination of his distortion pedal and his overdrive pedal. So yeah. uh, there's another mindset out there that thinks it's either one or the other. So you either use a distortion pedal or you use the overdrive. You can't use them together, but the truth of the matter is you can experiment with the sound, and you can... Yeah use a distortion and an overdrive pedal together, right? That's that's one of the most popular messages I'll get about a fuzz pedal when people say, what what pedal did Dave Gilmore use? I want to sound like Dave Gilmore. I say, well, he used this fuzz pedal, but good luck trying to sound like Dave Gilmore. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to need more than a pedal. <laughs> yeah, it's all about experimentation, and um, a lot of folks that just get into playing guitar and that's something that they have to learn. Uh, it's something I, it's a process I had to learn. I've been playing since I was uh, about 15 years old, so it's it's been a long time, 45 years. I'm still learning. I mean, there's still things that I'm just kind of futzing yeah, around absolutely. with, it, right? If you stop learning, then that's not a good thing, in my view. You you always have to continue to experiment. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not going to hit on a sound that you're going to use a lot. I I, I have that as a particular guitar sound that I like and I when I recorded my CDs during that period of time I would think okay well I like that sound and that sound tended to make its way into each individual song sometimes I would change it up obviously but other times you would that's what you like that's why some guitarists and musicians will say I like the Jimmy Page sound because Jimmy Page had his sound yeah absolutely. David Gilmore has his sound yeah uh, so uh, Jimmy Hendrix had his sound now, speaking of Hendrix, Hendrix used a fuzz pedal a lot, right? Yeah, the fuzz face. Yeah, the fuzz face, the round fuzz face. Maybe I'll put a picture up in the show so uh, folks can take a look at uh, what it looks like. And I read an article uh, where 
back in the day, Jimmy would go to a music store and uh, he would check out maybe 10 of the same pedal because Jimmy had said that uh, because it was the same manufacturer, it did not mean that the pedals generated or put out the same sound. Yeah. I thought that kind of interesting because um, I thought, well, you would think that the process and the circuitry was all standardized. But uh, maybe back then it was a little different. What are your thoughts on that? Was was Jimmy just being a little paranoid, or <laughs> no? That's definitely the case because everything was used uh, germanium transistors. Uh, there's a they can the, the sound can vary so drastically with just a slight difference in those transistors. So getting two that match perfectly uh, is going to give you a very different sound to two that match perfectly on an, on another range. So yeah, absolutely, it's very very true. Uh, you can see it now with all the modern germanium transistors, very, very difficult to get two sounding exactly the same, especially with the components coming out of China now, because it's not, the quality's not really the same with transistors, so as you used to, if they would build a batch of certain transistors, there's one transistor, transistor that I use, as, as they would bring them out, there would be 10 different versions of it, because it would be on a, a range, if you like. So now they just sell them as, there you go, that, that, that's the transistor under one value. Whereas before, when they were being made in America, you would have 10 different versions of that one transistor so you could get the precise value. Whereas now, that's just gone. You're just gambling now when you buy these from China, basically. You buy 50 and you're lucky if you find two. It's, it's what you need to, to get that sound, you know. It's, so, yeah, it's, it's tricky when that's concerned. I do fix guitars and repair guitars. A lot of the parts, whether we want to like it or not, are coming out of China. Yeah. That's the thing. Uh, when we buy bridges and when we buy uh, tailpieces and especially the electronic componentry, the pots and so on, and uh, yeah. it's coming out of China. Is that a good thing in your mind or I mean, because the prices have come down significantly, right? Because it's being mass produced. But what are your thoughts on that? Not good? No, nah, there's, there's a big price to pay elsewhere with that, unfortunately. It's, I mean, even the, the, the aluminium enclosures that I would use for a pedal. Uh, cast aluminium enclosures, they come from China as well. And, and where I live in Scotland, there used to be a, a big industry for metal and stuff like that, and it's all, it's all gone, <laughs> you know, and the same in computer and electronics industry. There was obviously quite a lot of that in America. There was a lot of that in Scotland just 20 years ago as well, and it's all, it's all disappeared. So you might get it cheaper, but we're, we're getting a lower standard, and the people in China don't look like they're benefiting much from it either, so. Yeah. What I've noticed is um, componentry like the potentiometers or the pots, the capacitors, uh, especially the pots are, um, I mean, they're functional, but the quality is not what you would get if you bought a more upscale potentiometer. Now, a lot of people will argue that, well, it's just an electronic component, so there's no sense paying more for it. But, you know, I, I don't know about that. First of all, you, you run the risk of the, um, of the cheaper component malfunctioning. That's number one. And in your view, Scott, you know, knowing all about the electronics of this, is there a loss of sound or a, a loss of signal if you're using cheaper components? Not necessarily a, lo not necessarily a loss of sound or a loss of signal, but definitely a, a smaller lifespan. I mean, it's something as simple as a foot switch. The ones you're buying from China, they'll have 10,000 with switches before they die than ones you would get elsewhere, you know, so it's, it, it really is just lifespan. I mean, they would maybe work to the, to the same uh, the same degree once you've got them going, but whether they'll, whether they'll last at all. And it's, it becomes very, people are just happy to throw stuff away because it only costs 40 bucks for the pedal. Ah, well, it's broken, never mind, you know. It's... Yeah, everything is commodity-based. In fact, um, I, I have pedals going back to... Uh the late 70s and 1980s, and uh, they still work. Yeah. Know, so these pedals are 30 or 40 years old. Now, I, I also wanted to cover with you, Scott, that uh, a big piece of your business or upside of your business is that you make custom pedals, but the customization is not just the, the componentry of the pedal itself, but it's the artwork. Yeah. So you can have your own unique pedal like, like I have here. Again, folks, I'll show you these pedals. Scott sent both of these over to me, and the artwork is great. Are these uh, silkscreen? How does this work? Yeah, that's like a vinyl decal that's put onto that. So it's a, a vinyl decal that's printed out and then 
put over it and then have a good few layers of lacquer just to get it all covered over again. I, when, with some of the enclosures, I do get them printed from like a factory where it's like uh, UV printed. But it's really, really expensive and I, I would love to get a UV printer so I could do each individual pedal like that, but it's about 15 grand for one of the printers. I'm like, I can't justify it just now. <laughs> Uh, so at the moment it's just uh, the vinyl decals, but they're, they're very durable and uh, they look good, you know. So it's, but yeah, um, I, again, it's a real u uniqueness to it that band, bands then can get their band logo and stuff like that on it, and it's it's a bit of a talking point for bands as well. When other bands see their pedal board and stuff like that, it's, it's can be kind of advertising in a way for the band as well, you know. It's, yeah. It's good advertising for me as well because it means people share the pedals on social media and stuff like that when they see something interesting, you know. So, it's, and I'm not. Um, well, it has its pros and cons because with the pedal demos, a pedal doesn't ever look the same. So when people, are, it's hard to recognise one of my pedals because they look different all the time, you know. It doesn't have that market placement of that's what that one looks like. There's a lot of pedals like a boss pedal, so you know exactly what a boss pedal looks like and stuff like that, you know. So, but on the other hand people get exactly what they want and we can get fun and creative on it as well. And it keeps my, it keeps my job interesting as well. <laughs> so how do they get the, uh, the artwork to you, Scott? I mean, do they submit a picture to you or are there cases when they have, maybe you have somebody who does artwork and they'll do a design, a special design? Yeah. For the ones that you've got, that was, um, a, a, a guy had bought a couple of pedals maybe about six months ago, and he said, my girlfriend is a really good artist. She's going to design the artwork for my pedals. So when she sent me the artwork, I was really, really impressed with it. I was like, I, I love your stuff, you know, it's, it's right up my street. And so when I came to doing your pedals, I got in contact with her and said, would you design these, this Billy Shears one for me? Uh, so some of them, people are just kind of taking pictures of their favourite cartoon stuff like that off the internet, you know, and they want that on the pedal. And in our ones, people are getting really creative. I've had some really wonderful art, hand-drawn art that people have sent me that's beautiful. And then the ones that I have liked, there's a couple of them I've said to the artist, right, do you mind if I give you a few quid and I'll use this as my standard artwork because it's beautiful? And they're like, yeah, because that's good promotion for me. And so, yeah, it's nice to be able to work with small artists like that as well. Now, Scott, your market, is it primarily in the UK or do you have uh, buyers and purchases from other parts of the world? Predominantly America, actually. Most of my sales are probably in America. And Scotland would be close behind because people are going to discover there's a pedal maker in Scotland. They would certainly like to try me out. Um, so I've got a lot of customers in Scotland and England as well through working with a lot of kind of smaller bands that I've been working with for a few years. Um, done quite well for themselves, you know, so the name's got about in England as well. But no, in, in America, it's been it's been good. I've been quite lucky that um, there's been a few bands that are quite well known that have picked up the pedals and uh, spoke about them somewhere, you know, so word gets out. And, um, when, I, when I first started the company, I, I must have been on my third or fourth pedal that I built, and it was a tremolo pedal that I was working on. And at that time, I was going out to Amsterdam with a few friends to see a band called Mars Volta. Uh, the bass player for Mars Volta, Juan Alderetti, he's got a pedal channel on YouTube. Bit of a pedal fiend, this guy. So I went out and, and gave him the pedal, just uh, said to the sound guy at the stage, do you mind if I slip back? And it's like currency when you show a sound guy a, a guitar pedal, you know? He's like, yeah, yeah, come in, come in. <laughs> so, <laughs> So I'm going to try and get into the habit of doing that more, you know, going to gigs and uh, trying to just speak to the band and saying, I'm a fan of the music, there's a wee gift. And if, it comes, if nothing comes of it, nothing comes of it. But most of the time, some, you hear something pop back up a wee while later. So trying, to, trying, to, trying to market the pedal without getting into marketing, if you like, you know, because it's just so horrible. Yeah, I was going to ask you how you were doing your marketing. So is it basically the website and word of mouth? Yeah, and social media, really. I mean, Facebook was, uh, before I even had the website, when I first started, I was just running it off a Facebook page, and it was really, really good at first. But then they started to uh, the boost your post stuff and all that a few years ago, you know, and they swallowed all your posts, so you can't really get anything out. Yeah. So Facebook's kind of lost its value for that. Um, Instagram is probably one of the best as far as social media is concerned for me for that, because it's all just pictures. Um, um, so, yeah, really just that. And, and word of mouth. 
Okay, well, hopefully we'll get a lot of word of mouth out with this show. I'd like to start going to a few more guitar shows. I've, I've done a couple in the past where you can set up a stall at a guitar show, but it's, it's expensive to do as well. And being a, a one-man band, it's, <laughs> it can be a bit of a headache, but yeah, I would definitely like to do that some more. Plus, it's, uh, it's long days whenever you do expos. Yeah, it's, it's kind of strange for me as well. The one I did in Edinburgh, um, I was in a small stand and I had Fender beside me who had like a massive stage with Harley Davidsons and leather couches and they complained about my volume like several times, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so I was a, a little bit out of place. <laughs> so Fender complained about the volume coming out of your booth? <laughs> yep. I'm like, you've got Harley Davidsons on your stage. <laughs> <laughs> So, Scott, how long now um, have you been in business? I forgot to ask you that question. How long have you been in the business of making pedals? Um, I started the company about five and a half years ago. I wasn't at it full time. I was still kind of working part time uh, to try and get the, the business off. But for the past three years, I've been at it full time. Uh, I was working part time last year. One of my friends opened up a restaurant and I was going down there for free food as much as possible. <laughs> you know, when you've got a friend with a restaurant, like, I'll help out. So I was down there quite a lot and uh, my, uh, the, the pedals took a wee, uh, a wee holiday for a couple of months last year, but now I came back at it and I'm glad to get my, my teeth back into it and get experimenting more, you know, rather than just building the same old pedals. I'm taking a bit more time to do a bit more experimenting and hopefully get something quite interesting out soon. Yeah, very good, very good. Well, it's uh, been a great discussion, Scott, and I'm really glad that we connected. And I want to thank you again for sending these pedals over. And um, he refused payment. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said, you, you, you've been my soundtrack for them, you know, when I'm sitting building pedals. If I'm not listening to music, I'm normally listening to, to a podcast or a lecture on something, you know. So it's, it's nice to be able to say thanks back or something like that, you know, something you appreciate. So. Well, thank you, Scott, for the kind words. And it's the reciprocating that really is wonderful, especially for those of us that are in the alternative research slash truther community. Yeah. So, and that's why you know, I wanted to do the show with you because it was the generosity of the pedals is just immense. And I was really taken back by it. So I wanted to, uh, to be able to get you on the show and also to, um, to help you out with your business because uh, music is really my first love. Yeah. As I mentioned when we started the show, I find things like making pedals and effects and stuff like that to be extremely fascinating. So it was really my pleasure to have you come on and talk about it. Uh, that's why I think it's been uh, so interesting and why so many people have gravitated towards your Paul's Dead research as well, though, because you are a musician. And because you're looking at it through the eyes of a genuine Beatle fan and stuff like that, you know. So, you know, a lot of us are going through that, you know, with, the, with the, uh, not just the Beatles, but all of our musician heroes through the years, you know. So it's to, to not just hear about someone coming at it through a conspiracy kind of way, you know, and coming at it from that side as well is, is nice. It's, I can understand why people do. Yeah, it's the hardest part of it, Scott, is that, like you said, I was a Beatle freak. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Beatles were... They were gods to me, you know, growing up and listening to their records. And uh, I, I have a vinyl collection of Beatle records that would blow people's minds. I mean, I, yeah. for years I collected their vinyl from all around the world. And some of the vinyl that I have is, uh, is very collectible. As I went down this journey and I started looking into what they were all about, you know, the air was taken out of the tire. <laughs> you know, just a little bit. And uh, people ask me now, and I'll ask you this question maybe before we uh, we end the show here. Uh, people will ask me, do I still enjoy the music? And the answer is, is yes, I still enjoy the music because the music is still very good. It's still great music. But here's the caveat. The spark that used to be in me with regard to what and who the Beatles were, based on the story that we were told, right? The myth that we were told yeah. made the music special. But once you get into what really went on, the special piece of it kind of gets stripped away. Yeah. And now it's not special to me anymore. Now it's a, uh, a person coming at it, at it, me being that person, 
and listening to the music and having an appreciation for the craftsmanship of the music, yeah. you know, the production value of the music, the layering of the tracks, you know, the quality of the construction of the songs that I still have a tremendous amount of appreciation for, but the, the glitter that used to be there, it's, it's not there anymore. <laughs> Sorry. No, absolutely. <laughs> what about yourself? How do you feel about it? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm probably sure you're finding there that I can still listen to their music. I, I listen to it in a very, very different way. Um, but that's not just, it's not just the case with the Beatles for me. It's been, that's been the case with so, so many bands that there's hardly any bands now that I can kind of look in the eye while I'm listening to. <laughs> there's very, very few left. Uh, it's, but like you say, their musical appreciation of it. I mean, there's there's so there's a lot of kind of modern bands that are gl glaringly obvious that they're the social engineering tools. But uh, some of the musicianship and like metal bands, not necessarily pop bands, you know. Like, I would say for an example would be a band like Slipknot. Who, when you look at, they're like something from an American wrestling thing, you know. It's like just cartoon. But yeah, you listen to the drummer, and I'm like, oh, wow, the drummer is amazing, you know. So I can still appreciate it certain aspects of it. I just don't buy into it the same way. I know what you're saying because I um, I was in the car yesterday and I had a Led Zeppelin CD and I popped it in, you know. I loved Led Zeppelin too. I still love Led Zeppelin. Jimmy Payne yeah, was yeah. a huge influence on me as a guitar player, Jimi Hendrix, you know. And, uh, and I'm listening to uh, Stairway to Heaven and I know from doing the work that there's backmasking in Stairway to Heaven. Yeah, yeah. It talks about Satan. And so as I'm listening to it, I'm thinking to myself, gee, is this the verse that has the backmasked message about Satan? You know, whereas before I got into all of this, I just enjoyed the song. You know? yeah. <laughs> but, you know, that's, there's, there's, there's something quite strange to that. I remember having this conversation with someone that I used to listen to the music differently before I learned how to play an instrument. You know, and then that almost changes because you listen to what the guitars do and the drums do. Whereas before, it was just like it was just like one piece that you listen to. You know, so yeah, it's, it's evolved it even more. That's a very good point. Yeah, we should talk about that a little bit because I have the same thing. When I go to concerts and I listen to the music, I listen to the music as a guitar player. You know, so I'm listening for how they're doing a bend or. You know, the tone of the guitar. We just went to go see Joe Bonamassa, who was, I, I love Joe Bonamassa. I mean, I know some people are like, oh, he's just a blues pentatonic guy. Yeah, but he's a great blues pentatonic guy. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and his band, along with Joe, they were impeccable. So as I'm sitting there in the audience, I'm listening to Joe play. I'm watching Joe play, taking a look and seeing if I could pick up something new for myself that I could steal from him. Yeah, you know? yeah. Whereas, you know, the person sitting next to me is not doing that. They're just taking in the listening experience. And sometimes I wish I can do that. Sometimes yeah, it's just yeah, good to something. listen, yeah. right? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, so Scott, before we head out, I want to make sure that we send people over to your website. And let me make sure I've got it right. It's Gojira, G-O-J-I-R-A dot C-O dot U-K. Do I have it correct? Gojira.co.uk. Okay. So I'm going to recommend to my audience, especially all the musicians out there and the guitar players, to go check out Scott's uh, website. He's got some great stuff there. And if you have a question or you want a unique or specialized pedal, then just reach out to Scott. And between yourself and Scott, you'll work it out and you'll have yourself a great pedal at a very reasonable price. Much appreciated, Mike. Uh, you're very welcome, Scott. And um, again, at the end of this video, what I'll do is I'll do a, a sound demonstration with your pedals. I'll try to get that done either today or tomorrow. And I'll see you on Facebook. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks a lot, mate. <laughs> All right, Scott. Have a great day. You too, my friend. Take care. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. And that concludes the discussion with Scott, and I hope you enjoyed the conversation. As mentioned during the show, I have added two short clips of me demonstrating the 808 and the distortion pedal. In the first video... I'm testing the 808 Tube Screamer with my Telecaster. The Tele is equipped with a set of Fender Texas Special pickups. In the second clip, I'm testing the distortion pedal and playing my Gibson Les Paul Standard T. The amp is an acoustic G35FX. I dialed in a little bit of delay and reverb to fill out the sound. I'm recording using my computer mic, which is a CAD U37 
and the software is Audacity. No other effects or enhancements were applied to the guitar or the video. My intent was to keep the demo as realistic as possible so we can hear the pedals as we would in real life playing at home or in a band. So here are the two clips, and please check out Scott's website and his Gojira FX pedals. Thanks for listening.